Um, it's my great pleasure today to introduce to you all um, Dr. Sven Beckert. Uh, in addition to being a best-selling author, he is the Laird Professor of American History at Harvard University, where he also is one of the co-directors of the Program on the Study of Capitalism, and you'll of course see why as we delve into this masterpiece. Um, in addition to Empire of Cotton, which we'll be talking a lot about today, um, he is also the author of The Moneyed Metropolis, which came out in 2001, which I also encourage you all to look at if you're interested in, in some of the themes that come up in, in Empire of Cotton and also looking more at the role of, of capitalism and, and sort of undertones of, of neoliberalism flow through it as well. Uh, he is the recipient of numerous fellowships, including the American Council on Learned Societies, the Guggenheim Fellowship, as well as the New York Public Library. So I'm really excited to have the opportunity to, to be in conversation with you today. Um, so this book, for those of you who haven't read it, it, it really is, and people talk about it as a masterpiece, and I started reading it, and, I, and that word just kept coming into my head, like this is a huge undertaking. It is, a, it is an absolute masterpiece. It is a global history, and we'll talk a little bit about you know, how one digs into doing such a huge project. I'm, I'm, I'm really eager to hear your thoughts on that. But let's, let's start about talking the, the, of some of the particular themes you raise in, in the book. So you talk about how cotton was the industrial revolution's launching pad. Can you say more about that? And specifically, how did this set the tone um, for understandings of labor in the Industrial Revolution, and how did that carry over then to the Informational Revolution? Right, these, these are great questions, but, but first, thank you so much for being here. Uh, thank you also to the Boulder Public Library for providing the space here. It is so wonderful to see public space being used for good purposes, and we don't have enough of that, so uh, that's a really wonderful thing. Uh, so Empire of Cotton. So Empire of Cotton is basically about this stuff. This is a very small bale of cotton, which I'm going to pass around because I think it's a nice thing to be able to feel what it is that I'm writing about. So if you can, can you catch that? Okay. And uh, please return it at the test. end of, uh, of, this, of this session. So basically the book is a 5,000 year history of this stuff, of cotton, and it takes it... Uh, from the Indus Valley 5,000 years ago to modern day China, and it takes it from the people who grow cotton to the people who spin it, weave it, and then also eventually consume it in all kinds of forms, but most importantly as cloth. Um, the, uh, the, 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 the book, because this commodity, because cotton is so incredibly global, and because it has been so incredibly important to so many different parts of the world, it allows me to tell a story about history that is not primarily rooted in a particular national history, such as the history of the United Kingdom or the history of the United States or the history of India, but it allows me to look at and understand and analyze how developments in very different parts of the world are related to one another. And this, this is an Indian literary festival being held in the United States, and indeed, both India and the United States are very important to the story of cotton and in a way are deeply linked to one another for, uh, for since the founding of the United States, since the very, very beginning. Uh, but cotton is not just, as you just mentioned, cotton is not just a, a commodity that has a fascinating history, a long history, and a history that links very different parts of the world to one another, but it has a history that is really important to understanding how the modern world in which we all live today, from India to the United States, how this modern world came about. And one of the most important things about the modern world is, of course, that the way how we organize our economic life changed very drastically in the past 500 years, and it especially changed in the wake of the Industrial Revolution, which began around the 1780s in the United uh, Kingdom and then uh, uh, spread to other parts of the world, including eventually also to India. Um, so this, because I'm looking at cotton and because cotton is central to the Industrial Revolution, whoever industrialized, industrialized first in cotton. So this applies, of course, to the United Kingdom, but it also applies to the United States. Just think of the cotton mills in Massachusetts, in Fall River, uh, in, in Pennsylvania and elsewhere, uh, but it also applies to India. The first steps at Indi Indian industrialization were taken in the cotton industry in Ahmedabad and in uh, Bombay. 
Um, but um, so cotton is very central to, to, to the process of industrialization. And of course, when we, and you ask about the question of labor. So when we think about the making of the modern world, when we think about uh, the making of modern capitalism, when we think about the Industrial Revolution, we first and foremost think about the vast expansion of wage labor, of people who entered factories to operate machines, to spin, to weave, to stitch together clothing and all kinds of things. And that's certainly a very, very important part of the Industrial Revolution. Often, as you know, working conditions were quite terrible, but workers were generally paid wages for the time they spent in the factories. But what, uh, what, 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 if you look at the, the, the history of cotton, what that shows you is that this expansion of free wage labor went ahead with a vast expansion and intensification of slave labor at the same time. Because as most of you will know, the United States in the beginning of the 19th century became the world's most important producer of raw cotton for global markets. And uh, almost all of that cotton until 1865 was grown by enslaved workers. So what we can see by looking at cotton is this strange combination of, on the one hand, the expansion of industrialization, the expansion of wage labor, and on the other hand, the expansion of plantation agriculture and of slave labor. And I think, I think that's interesting as we think about the present, right? And as we think about the flows of, of cotton and of these products in, in, in the present, and I'm specifically thinking, you know, a lot of my work in the past has been on human trafficking, right? And I'm thinking about, you know, a lot of your book is, is a story about capitalism, right? And I'm thinking about how capitalism has brought in and evoked this global race to the bottom, right? It's a global race to the bottom, not only in terms of the price of goods, but also in terms of bodies and laborers, right? And, and, and I think what's so powerful about your book is it makes really explicit the links between slavery, capitalism, and colonialism. So I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about, about the kind of neo-colonialism that capitalism, when it's unchecked, can, can bring about. You know, how, how does this work, you know, how do we see reverberations of it in today's context of the digital divide and globalization, which has resulted in these severe inequalities? Right, yeah. right. okay, these are really important uh, and very, very large questions. But maybe I say first a few words about colonialism, since you mentioned that, because the expansion of, uh, of, of industrialization in, in Western Europe and North America, of course, went also hand in hand, and here the Indian story comes in quite centrally, with the intensification of colonial uh, the power, uh, of European powers in, in, in Asia, Africa, and, and elsewhere. And, uh, and so that story is certainly also very, very important to this expansion of industrialization as it takes place uh, in some parts of the world. And the basic argument of the book is that we cannot think of the one without the other. I mean, obviously industrialization is not just about enslavement and colonialism, but it's also about enslavement and also about colonialism. Without the uh, imposition of uh, British colonial rule in India, um, the, the, the kind of technology transfer that happened between Indian spinners and weavers and British in spinners and weavers, or then also the, the domination of the Indian cotton textile market by British producers would have been unimaginable, but that domination of the export market was for Britain quite decisive because by the second half of the 19th century, already half of all cotton textiles produced in, in, in the United Kingdom get exported to the Indian market, so this market is crucially important. So this is just to, a few words about colonialism. And then to take the story into the present, I mean, um, and into other industries. I mean, this is very, very complicated because of course, uh, certain things do change quite fundamentally. So for example, slave labor today certainly does exist, but I, would be, I wouldn't want to argue that it's in any way at the center of the global economy, yeah? unlike in the 1830s when it was really at the center of the global economy, but that is not the case now. So there is significant change. You know, it's not just all more of the same, but, but there is significant change. But um, but what you can see today, and today maybe even much clearer than 20 years ago, is that there is, um, 
that there is not this, this idea that people had in the 1950s and 1960s that the world is kind of on the march to becoming ever more like the kind of Western Europe of the 1860s, 1960s or the United States of the 1960s dominated by huge corporations, stable employment, wage labor, uh, relatively well-paid uh, workers. You know, this is not, as we now know, the way the world is evolving. Uh, there is, to this day, uh, and perhaps surprisingly, increasingly, there is a whole diversity of labor regimes in different parts of the world. Uh, some of them are the classical wage labor model as it comes out of the Industrial Revolution, but just look at, you know, and look at Uber. You know, there are lots of models of, 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 of labor now that, that are just very different from the classical wage labor uh, model, but then there's also, of course, uh, you know, it, the, 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 there is a, a kind of a vast uh, uh, exploitation in the, in the world's countryside, which is not based on enslavement, but, it, you know, debt peonage and other such things are really still quite, um, quite common. So what I conclude from all of that, I mean, there's a huge diversity of labor regimes. And what I conclude from that, from, from a historical study based on the commodity of cotton and a historical study of capitalism is actually that capitalism does not lead to ever greater sameness, but that what capitalism is fundamentally is, is a kind of connected diversity. That, that's the essence of capitalism, and that's also the secret for the great, uh, uh, the, the great success story uh, of, 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 of capitalism. It connects very different kinds of things, very different kinds of labor regimes, for example, to one another across vast geographic spaces. So you cannot think about capitalism by looking at one particular part of the world, by looking even at one country, by looking at one continent. You can only understand the dynamics of capitalism and the history of capitalism by looking at the world as a whole. And of course, how these connections unfold changes significantly over time. I mean, in 1830, if you would have told a British cotton manufacturer in Manchester or a cotton trader in the city of Memphis, that one day India, or for that matter, China, would be major uh, contributors to the empire of cotton in the year 2019, that uh, would have been completely unimaginable. I mean, all alone the kind of racist thinking about the word would have made that particular thought uh, just fantastic, unimaginable. But there you see that, you know, there are very significant changes and often changes that are uh, quite unpredictable. Today, China is the center of the empire of cotton. So, you know, you're talking about, about capitalism and how kind of the his, this history of capitalism. One of the things I was fascinated to learn from reading your book, and full disclosure, I, I was a graduate student kind of coming of age as an activist at the turn of this, this century. So, you know, I was there for the WEF protests, right, all the sort of anti-globalization protests. And one of the things I was surprised to learn from, from your book is that there's actually a long history of government involvement and, and, and you know, the, the role of the government in facilitating, building, and financing the infrastructure of, of this enterprise. It really challenges our, especially my generation's kind of romanticized notions of a past where everything was unchecked. Right? Can you can you speak to that a little bit? Because that that was yeah. one of the real you know there are so many gems in here. That was one of the really big aha moments for for me, and I think it would be for many people in in my generation. Right, right, right. And uh, and in some ways, the the extent of how important the state was to this history of cotton. I mean, this is first and foremost the global history of cotton. It also talks about capitalism, but I mostly talk about cotton. But, but in some ways that came as a surprise to me as well. I mean, I always thought that the state plays an important role in uh, the unfolding of, the, uh, of capitalism in the past 500 years, but how important it really was, uh, was, was also somewhat of a surprise to me. And of course, here in this country especially, we have somehow, many people have persuaded themselves that there is, you know, on the one hand, there's kind of the free enterprise system, capitalism, and on the other side, there's a state, and they are almost hostile to one another, mutually exclusive. The more state we have, the less capitalism, and the less state, the more capitalism. Was that right? Yeah, I think so. <laughs> so, you know, that sounds like a beautiful idea, 
And, you know, there's certainly on a kind of very abstract level, you could make a plausible argument that this is indeed the case. But if you look at history, which I do, if you look at the actual existing history of capitalism instead of some imaginary ideological construction about what it is supposed to be, then you can only conclude that the capitalism as it has unfolded in the past 500 years is really a co-production of the free enterprise system and, and the state. The state was everywhere in uh, the global history of cotton and in the global history uh, of capitalism. And we already mentioned, for example, we mentioned uh, colonialism, which is, you know, uh, very largely about the state, but not, not only. The East India Company is a private organization, but, but of course also with strong backings uh, by the state. If you think about slavery, slavery is of course also uh, guaranteed by, by laws and, and thus is also an institution of the state. The entire system of wage labor is very much embedded within uh, the legal system and with, uh, within state regulations. Uh, the, the, everywhere you look, the state has played an enormously important role uh, in, um, in shaping the empire of cotton and with it also uh, shaping modern capitalism. So I think when we think about capitalism, we need to think about the state and the free enterprise system simultaneously at the same time. And, uh, and the actually existing capitalism that we have is a co-production of the state uh, and of uh, entrepreneurs uh, and others, and what that of course tells you also, and maybe that's, you know, since probably not all of you are so interested in history, but more about the contemporary world, what this also tells you is that, uh, that, 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 that the world we live in today is, you know, it's, it, it, can be politically, uh, it can be politically shaped because it is already politically shaped, it is already political construction, right? So we have, you know, we are not just uh, victims of some system that's out there that is unfolding beyond our control, but it's really something that we can politically shape and we have always politically shape, shaped and we will be able to shape politically uh, in the future. And this is not a corruption of capitalism, but this is the very essence of what capitalism is about. So I want to turn now to talk a little bit about something that you refer to as the military cotton complex, right? And so for those of you who haven't read the book, um, you know, here we're turning now to a different sort of, you, you've got the tactile cotton that's going around. Here we're turning now to a different sort of tactileness, which is land, okay? And I think it's really salient for us as we sit here on Cheyenne and Arapaho land, for us to think about the history of, of land and, and how the land has been appropriated and, and misappropriated. And so you, you, you make a really powerful argument about how the military cotton complex, as you call it, resulted in a lot of Native Americans losing their land. H how might we think about, about the history of this product in terms of questions around belonging and land and ownership and kind of what we have done to land as a result of, of, of this one product. Right, so it's, that's, uh, the, 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 you know, so we talked about labor, and there was a lot of dispossession in the process of mobilizing labor, because in some ways enslavement was, of course, a dispossession of somebody's labor power and all kinds of other things as well. And then there is the other side uh, of the story, which is the dispossession of, 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 of land. Um, so uh, the, 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 once, once cotton became a plantation crop, which was approximately in the mid, uh, in the mid 18th century, it first grew on, on, in the West Indies, uh, and then by the late 18th century, 1795 approximately, it moved to the southern parts of the United States. Uh, it was a land intensive crop and the way it was cultivated uh, also exhausted the soil, so there was a need for ever more land to grow that cotton. And as you mentioned, that land was occupied by native peoples and, uh, uh, and, uh, and so they were, um, uh, they were dispossessed uh, uh, and, uh, and uh, as, as significant numbers of them uh, we're, we're pushed into, uh, out of Georgia, Mississippi, Alabama, uh, and other southern states uh, into what is now o Oklahoma, and many died in the process of this forced, uh, forced migration. Uh, so, so there is, 
so the expansion of cotton agriculture, which in a way is linked to the expansion of industrial production in North America and Western Europe, went hand in hand with the process of, of vast dispossessions. Uh, first in the United States, because this was uh, where most of the cotton for European industry and North American industry was grown, but eventually that process also moved into other parts of the world. So for example, by the, uh, in the post-Civil War era, when slavery comes to an end, uh, uh, Western uh, industrial powers are looking for other sources of raw cotton outside the United States, and they find them, for example, in Western Anatolia, in the Ottoman Empire, where there are uh, also nomadic people who use the land, but they are now pushed off that land because it's gonna be used for cotton plantations. It's also, uh, to some extent, uh, the case in, um, in, 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 in Western Africa. Uh, so, so there is, you know, the expansion of industrial production goes along with the dispossession of land, and this is, of course, now cotton is just one example for this particular story, because if you think of other commodities, uh, such as uh, uh, sugar or tea or coffee. Uh, other commodities, of course, also are land intensive and also lead to massive dispossessions of people in different parts of the world. And so this raises now a big <laughs> question and a kind of irony because, of course, capitalism is supposed to be about property rights, right? right? I mean, if you would be pushed to define what is capitalism, we probably would all agree that the first thing for capitalist society to, to be there is private property rights and that they are somehow fairly secure. But the expansion of capitalism actually went along with vast dispossessions. So for some people, the expansion of capitalism meant that their property rights were taken away, that they were extremely insecure. It's one of many of these uncomfortable contradictions that that you know that that you write about, and as and I I think that the perspective of, of a global history allows you to bring to the fore these really uncomfortable. It's really hard to sit with these with these contradictions. Um, so you mentioned other products, right? And as I was reading your book, it, it made me think of one of my favorite books to teach as an anthropologist, which is Sidney Mintz's book Sweetness and Power. I don't know if any of you have read it. Sid, uh, Sweet, Sweetness and Power is a, is a global history of sugar. Um, and he looks similarly at um, the role of sugar, the production, you know, the harvesting, the production, and then the selling back oftentimes to the very same communities from which it was extracted, right? The cane was extracted. I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about these parallel histories in the sense of, let's, I know there are many other commodities we could talk about, but, but you know, I, I really think since Sweetness and Power, I haven't seen such a magnificent book until I saw your book. And so I think these two books are, are really interesting, these two parallel histories. Um, can you speak a little bit to, to if we're just thinking about sugar and cotton and these, the, the parallels? No, you're absolutely right. Uh, Sidney Mintz's book, Power and Sweetness, is a, is a beautiful book. I just taught it again last Me week. Yeah. I teach it every year. Yeah. I love this book. Yeah. And, uh, and certainly, uh, it, it, it in some ways inspired me to, to go on, onto this uh, adventure of, of trying to understand the global history of cotton. There are lots of other commodities that are not so great, but, but Sidney Mintz's book is, uh, is, is beautiful. And it is uh, a beautiful party because it, uh, it, it does show how the expansion of plantation slavery, mostly in the, in the Carib Caribbean and in Brazil, how this is uh, linked to, uh, to, the, uh, to the emergence of capitalism and especially how the calories being produced on Caribbean plantations are actually becoming extremely important to feed an industrial population that increasingly is not working on the land anymore. So in Britain and in some other parts of the world, increasingly people move away from the countryside, they move into cities, they don't grow food anymore, they need calories, and the sugar, as Sydney Mintz shows, becomes very, very important to, to feed the, the new industrial uh, proletariat. So this is a, a, a very powerful argument, and I think the other powerful argument he makes is that when we think about the modern world, we usually start, I mean, if you, I ask you, you know, when you think about the making of the modern world, you probably would think, you know, maybe of Lancashire, or, or maybe of, you know, maybe you would think of Henry Ford or Andrew Carnegie or things like that. But you would not think about Barbados or Saint-Domingue or Jamaica. But Sidney Mintz actually makes the argument that the origins of the modern world are just as much to be found in the Caribbean plantations than they are to be found in the 
industrial sites that are so familiar to all of us today. And I think that's a very powerful argument. These are the first really capital intensive industrial enterprises. They are organized along industrial lines. They mobilize huge numbers of workers, all of them enslaved or most of them enslaved. So there is something very, very modern about this plantation complex that begins to emerge in the 17th century or 16th century in the Caribbean. Um, but the difference, okay, why you should be reading about cotton and not about sugar. <laughs> no. Both, you both. <laughs> no, you should we be needed a sequel. You should be reading about sugar. You should be reading about sugar. But, but, uh, but, but what, what's the difference between, between sugar and, 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 and cotton? So, so I think one difference in, in the, between the two books is that Sidney Mintz, in the end, even though it comes, a, you know, it, it, it's, it, it, he, he uh, presents it as a global history, but it's really a history that connects the Caribbean to England or maybe to Western Europe. Uh, you know, now, inspired by his work, other people have studied the history of sugar, and we understand much better that, for example, India or China or Java play major roles in this global history of sugar that Sidney Mintz, for no fault of his, does not uh, address. Empire of Cotton, in that way, is much more global because it really does try to keep the entire uh, globe in view, or at least all parts of the globe that are important to the story of the global empire of, of cotton. And second, sugar did, became important to the Industrial Revolution in so far that it fed parts of the Industrial Working Clause, but it did not in itself launch an Industrial Revolution. And I think here, the beauty of looking at cotton is that it combines the, in, the agricultural aspects of the story, the transformation of the countryside, the mobilization of labor in the countryside. It combines it with the Industrial Revolution that we started out talking about at the very beginning, right? The emergence of modern factories, that is in the cotton industry. And, uh, uh, and I think, you know, the modern factory and the kind of productivity advances that go hand in hand with that modern factory are very significant to our modern world. Yeah, maybe the plantation is also important. I would agree with that. But the factory is also very important. And this book, in a way, tries to keep both of these balls in the air to focus on the countryside and at cities, at agriculture and at industry. And cotton allows me to do exactly that. So, I mean, the, it is a huge undertaking, this book, right? A global history, 5,000 years, right? I, I'm trying to write about, like, five years right now, and it's making me crazy, right? Um, 5,000 years, it's, it's a huge undertaking. I'm wondering if we can talk a little bit about the experience for you of writing this book. I mean, what, what's it like to tackle such a huge topic over such an enormous period of time? What, what's that experience like? Yeah, it, it's a quite an adventure, and it took uh, took a long time. Um, but, but you know, to, for truth in advertising, I mean, the book does deal with five thousand years of history, but it deals with the first four thousand years on the first thirty-five pages. So, <laughs> so don't tell them that. <laughs> so we are here really mostly interested. I mean, the the, the, the earlier history of cotton is, is super fascinating. But but you know, I'm more of a modernist. I mean, I study mostly the nineteenth century, so I'm. I'm, I'm mostly f interested here in how cotton speaks to the emergence of the modern world as we know it today. And, and so we move pretty quickly <laughs> through the first uh, 4,000 uh, 4, years. But, um, but it was, you know, in a way, it, 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 was a, it was a great adventure to write this book. I mean, partly because it literally took me to all continents to research it. Uh, I'm trying to tell the global history not just from a kind of satellite perspective, to keep the entire world uh, in view at the same time, but I very much try to tell the global history from a local perspective. So I sometimes focus just on one plantation or on one factory or even just on one worker or on one merchant, and I take that story from that person, from this place or from this factory or from this plantation out into the larger world to explain how you know, some larger transformations uh, occurred, and I think that's the only right way of doing that, which presumably is also, you know, what an anthropologist would do in even greater detail, perhaps. Uh, so it's a global history told from multiple local perspectives, and uh, and in order to research these local stories, I had to go to these places, and that was a great adventure because I learned uh, uh, the new histories, I learned about uh, different places. I encountered uh, very different archives, um, but uh, but but the, but the but when I started writing the book, I 
did not imagine this as the final product, nor could I have imagined it, because I really, much of what is in this book, I didn't know when I started writing it. I mean, it was literally a process of learning while I was doing it. So, for example, I remember very distinctly when I was sitting at the New York Public Library on a fellowship and was starting this book, I thought, okay, I know a lot about the United States, I know something about Europe, and then I need to learn a little bit about India and Egypt too, and there we are, you know, this is the empire I've gotten. Uh, that turned out to be uh, not true. The, the, the story became much more global than I thought of it at the beginning. Uh, and of course, the local stories are much more complicated than you think of them at first. So, for example, one region of the world that I write a fair amount about, but which I didn't think at the beginning I would have anything to say about, is, is Western Africa, which becomes uh, a somewhat significant source of raw cotton for European industry. And um, I knew very little about West African history. And in order to be able to say anything about cotton in West Africa, I first had to kind of tackle the basic outlines of what happened in West Africa in the past 200 years. Uh, and that made it all extremely, uh, extremely uh, 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 complicated, but it was also, it, 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 you know, suddenly in the process of writing, in the process of research, in the process of writing, I suddenly, it dawned on me, you know, that we can understand our history from a different vantage point, that in some ways we have limited ourselves by always telling our histories from a national viewpoint, that much of our history we cannot understand except from a global, uh, global perspective. Uh, so this was, you know, from a kind of professional viewpoint, that was one of the lessons that I drew doing that. And from a more personal viewpoint, it also really struck me that despite all the divisions we have created in the world and all the terrible wars we have fought, you know, we are all on it together. You know, we are all on Spaceship Earth and we all are linked to one another in what we do in very deep and meaningful ways. And we have been linked to one another in very deep and meaningful ways for 500 years at the very least. I love the local to global connections that you make. I, I had a professor in graduate school who said that the best books, really, you know, the best books, reading them is similar to the experience of looking through a microscope, where you're constantly able to shift the lenses, like to go really deep in and then to pull really back out. And that was for me what the experience of reading your book was. There would be times when you're really deep in and you're in there with, you know, the experiences of a few people and you're really seeing it on the ground, but then you're able to shift back and forth through space and time, and, and, and I think it's so, so beautifully done. I, I want to ask um, a question, and I know we have to turn to the audience in a moment. Um, some might call this, this important work a trade or a crossover book, right? And, and we're both academics, and we know the kind of the politics of, of that. Um, so can you talk about this experience of crossing over, if you will, with, with, a, with a book that speaks to so many audiences? Yeah, like, like all authors, I did not know what kind of audience this book would have, or if it would have any audience. You know, sometimes I was like, who that is going to be interested in reading about cotton, you know? I mean, I got very much carried away by it, but, but I was not certain that anybody else would possibly want to read something like this. So, you know, first and foremost, I was delighted to see that people in many different countries around the world uh, have taken an interest in this book and in the topic and have translated it and, uh, and engaged with it in, in many ways. So this was a posi very positive thing. And, um, and yes, much what we do speaks to very small audiences, uh, to our colleagues, to our students. Um, and that's a good thing because, you know, we do sometimes things that are rather technical and, uh, you know, most people in the world would not necessarily be interested in that kind of... Uh, engagement and that kind of very technical work does help us uh, advance our understanding of anthropology or history or economics or whatever else it is. Um, and uh, indeed, I could not have written this book without the hundreds of thousands of books that had been written on particular plantations, on particular factories, or particular industrial regions, or particular merchant families. Uh, all of that was super important uh, to, to this book. Um, but then I also think, you know, it's, it's a wonderful thing to be able to speak to larger audiences because uh, 
I, I, I think people, you know, many, many people in all around the world are interested in history. I mean, we all kind of want to know where we come from, right? That's, an, I think, an almost human trait. We want to understand what it is that got us here. And, uh, and the kinds of issues that this book raises are obviously of great political relevance or, or social relevance or economic relevance to the situation we find ourselves in uh, today. And so, um, so it's, uh, I, I was you know, really happy that, the, that people, people saw that in the book and that they engaged with it. And then I also think, you know, sometimes I think, look, we are so privileged, you know, we, we, we get paid for sitting in the library to read and to think and to write. No, this is a really great privilege. I mean, very few people in the world have that privilege. And, and so I also feel we have a responsibility to society to provide something that is of interest to people who are, you know, not, uh, not, not having this particular privilege or maybe also not the inclination to do this kind of thing. But, but, but I feel like, you know, if we just double down ever deeper into our scholarly holes, which we can easily do, and we become ever more incomprehensible to ever smaller groups of people. <laughs> yeah. Actually, there are people who say that most academic articles get read by exactly zero readers, okay? <laughs> so, <laughs> so... Unless you know, we assign them. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, you know, so it's, it's, I think it's all in all extremely positive. And, and you know, I've, I've engaged with very different kinds of audiences in very different parts of the world. And, uh, you know, I mean, even people who, uh, who have uh, no PhD in history or, or uh, I, I mean, you know, I think most people are pretty smart, you know, and they have a really great, they have a really deep understanding often of exactly the kinds of issues that this book raises. Maybe they don't know the literature, you know, but, but they, but they've thought about these issues, and sometimes they have really, uh, really important things to say about this. And, and certainly, I have also learned a lot from just speaking to audiences who are not in the typical academic mm -hmm. circuits. Uh, um, and, and so that, I think, all in all, this has been extremely yeah. positive. So last question before we, we throw it out to, to the audience. Um, you said that you know people are interested in knowing you know where we where we've been where we come from right i think that as humans we're also interested in where we're going too right for, and for me that's why i love being a professor that's why i love teaching is because in my students i can see the future and so what i want to ask you is you know we're both professors we we both get to teach kind of the next generation of 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 scholars and of thinkers and people who are wrestling with these issues um, i know for me when i'm writing my books um, the, the books I'm most proud of are the ones that were both inspired by and inspired my teaching. So I, I want I just you know would love for you to to reflect on the role of your students as you were you know writing this book um, and how you know how you taught. So what's been the experience of teaching this work and 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 how that that informed your process? Right. No, that's that's certainly uh, ex extremely important. Uh, I think I learn as much from my students as I hope they might possibly learn from me. I mean, the, you know, some of the best ideas, I think, evolve in a conversation with the students, and I'm very fortunate. I have really excellent students, uh, and I also have students from literally all corners of the world. So if I, you know, want to know something about Anatolia, I have a student who knows Anatolia really well, and I can converse with her. I have a student who's from Tanzania, so I can converse with him about cotton in East Africa, you know. so so. I, this is, uh, this is really uh, 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 crucially important, but also then on a more conceptual level. I mean, they, you know, students nowadays, I, I teach the history of capitalism, they flock in very large numbers to these courses because they are really, you know, they try to understand what this thing is that seems to dominate their lives to such an enormous degree, and they try to also understand how to navigate living in a capitalist society and what this means uh, for our Future, of course, people always want to know about the future. You know what what comes next. I mean, this is the weird thing as a historian. You know, you spend years trying to understand the past, and then the first question you get is what like, is "What's going to happen next?" And my answer is, "Look, I don't know." It, this is a, I, <laughs> so in that way, it's all pretty useless. Except I think, <laughs> I think what's what it's good for. I mean, it helps you understand obviously how we get got in. To where we are right now, but but it also helps you develop the tools to understand the world, 
And if you apply those tools then to the contemporary moment, that might help you navigate the contemporary moment and think about the future. And if you think, if you, if you remember what I said at the very beginning about the political nature of markets and the relationship between the state and capitalism, of course that is, uh, you know, of relevance also to the to, to the to the contemporary moment. Well, thank you so much. I, I could ask a million more questions, but I know we have to turn it to our to our audience. Um, so I think we've got some microphones going around, but I, I, I saw the first hand up right over here. So, so yes, uh, please. Microphone on this side, microphone on this side. So when you wish to ask a question, please put up your hand. Do you want but she's first. Could I, could I have some water? Amaya, this gentleman here too. You'll go second. Could I, sorry, could I get some more water? Uh, more water? Yeah, is that yes. possible? Yeah. Okay. Hello, thank you. Uh, oh, hello. It's weird being right by my voice. So I was an undergrad about 20 years ago, and I remember the term of um, everyone was sort of excited about China and backdoor capitalism and how that would bring democracy to China, which obviously hasn't happened. And so I was wondering sort of about that idea, and then how much has time sped up in the last 20 years? Okay, these are two really great and really complicated questions. Uh, I mean, the, the, the question about China, I think that's a really interesting one because for a long time, the, we told ourselves the story that there is a kind of expansion of markets, urbanization, people get more educated, they get wealthier, a vibrant civil society develops, like the one we see right here in front of our eyes. And that, in some way or another, leads then to democratic outcomes, right? So the idea was that the expansion of capitalism goes hand in hand with the expansion of democracy, and it's almost the same thing. And of course, this was a beautiful story. I mean, there were people always critical of that, but, but, but still, if you look back now to that kind of conversation that was prevalent in the 1950s and 1960s, it's a beautiful story, and it would have been very nice if this would have been true. But, uh, but now it seems, for the reasons that you just mentioned, it seems that it's uh, at the very least uh, more complicated. And uh, we see now, you know, the China, if you look at it in world historical perspective, the expansion of the Chinese economy is the most dynamic that has ever happened in human history. It, I think it is fundamentally a capitalist society. You know, so you see that enormous capitalist economic growth can happen under very authoritarian regimes. Um, and in some ways, you know, my history of cotton also shows, you know, that there are elements that are definitely not particularly liberal or democratic, also in the earlier history of capitalism of the 18th and 19th century. So in the way the West also told stories to the rest of the world about itself that weren't entirely true. You know, like, yes, there was an expanding suffrage in the United Kingdom, but, you know, in India, that was not exactly the case. So, so th that, of course, all rested on a kind of misreading, a almost willful misreading of the actual history uh, of the world. But okay, but now we see clearly that you know, capitalism does not necessarily need to bring about a democratic or not even a liberal society. Um, and if you ask me, I think that's a worrisome thing. Yeah, that is, uh, you know, it, it shows in a way that you know, the kind of liberal democratic society in which most of us have been living for most of our lives uh, is, uh, is not to be taken for granted and that it originates from something else than just the natural unfolding of history. You know, it, 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 takes, uh, it takes people willing to protect it and people to, 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 to fight for it. Yeah? And, um, and um, you know, we will see how this plays out. Yeah? It's right over here. It's, um, number two. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, giving us the history of cotton, 5,000 years old. But basically, the, basically yeah, uh, the change in use of cotton has come up with the price of oil, which was $2 a barrel in 50s and 60s. And uh, cotton as a textile was replaced by polyester and nylon. Now, Polyester is what we are wearing here, most of us. Cotton has been used, I mean the fields of cotton has been used for alternative 
agricultural products. So the replacement of cotton in terms of polyester, nylon, acrylic, uh, it has been uh, very much contributed to reduction of cotton market. Now, how do you think the technology can change that? Okay, good. Uh, okay, that's a great question and something that we haven't discussed uh, previously. I mean, again, I, I can't predict the future, but, but what I can say is it's true that for the past 15 or 20 years, cotton is not the dominant textile fiber anymore, but it's petroleum-based fibers, uh, as, as you mentioned. But <coughs> cotton still has a very, very substantial market share. Um, last year, the world produced 124 million bales of cotton. If you would put them on top of one another, it would be a tower 40,000 miles high. So that's a pretty big pile of, uh, of cotton. And the production of cotton continues to increase, even though the percentage as a, as a textile fiber is, is, is decreasing. Uh, and the predictions, are, I mean, I read predictions that there are expectations that the consumption of cotton is going to double in the next 20 or 30 years, partly because people are dressing better. In much of the world, there was very little cloth available for a very, very uh, a, a long time, and with the, uh, uh, with the rise of... Uh, 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 global middle class is a, uh, is a, a vastly expanded uh, consumption of, of textiles, and even if most of them, are, or some of the, the, the slight majority, are made out of petroleum-based fibers, still the cotton consumption is increasing as well. And then we see, you know, we see the, uh, uh, you know, kind of the vast increase in the consumption of of, of, of textiles. Maybe there's some textiles coming in right that, now. Uh, that that. Uh, uh, you know that that is uh, that is unprecedented. I mean, the rise of fast fashion. You go to H and M now, or you know, you buy a T-shirt for three dollars ninety-five uh, cents. I mean, it's almost you know not not worthwhile to wash it anymore. I mean, this is just this is you know once upon a time, as you know, you know a piece of cloth was something very valuable. I mean, people would keep it, and they would often keep it for generations. I mean, just you know, when I look at my kids, you know, they certainly are not thinking about you know, the next, the future, they don't even think about what they're going to wear next month. It might be against something else. Yeah? So, so there is a vast increase in the consumption of cotton, despite that what you are saying is also true. And that, of course, has huge environmental implications. And the carrying capacity of the earth is, you know, I don't know how much more cotton we can produce. Okay, what a great conversation, and I, I want to thank you both, and to say that I personally have been a longtime advocate of historian Eric Erickson's idea that intergenerational dialogue between elders and youth about the professed values of a country and where it may be going is crucial to the survival, much less thriving, of any uh, society. And uh, you both have mentioned learning from your students and your students being particularly interested in how they can make their way in the future. And so specifically on this book, uh, I'd like to ask you both, um, and particularly you, Sven, uh, Thomas Piketty came out with his capitalism in the 21st century in 2013. It was on everybody's coffee table. Apparently no one read it uh, except myself and a handful of people. And what he said in 2016 was that if the ideas that Bernie Sanders put forth in 2016 did not get adopted by an American president in either 2020 or 2024 at the latest, that capitalism as we know it, current global capitalism, would collapse. And he said it might be a person of a different gender or a different color, but that uh, he was basically saying an updated version of FDR's uh, remedy for unregulated capitalism had to be adopted. And here in Boulder last night, AOC was here to a totally sold out audience. And we're seeing now, uh, for instance, millennials and in, uh, your students saying, uh, you know, this guy, maybe an old guy, Bernie, uh, but uh, if you think about his ideas, uh, this idea of some kind of democratic socialism seems to really make sense. So uh, how do you see that happening in your students, and are they 
uh, taking into account, say, Andrew Yang's kind of focus on automation and robotics and the end of factory jobs as we know it and wage jobs and so on, just to take a stab from them as to what they think is coming. Okay, it's, it's very difficult to generalize about this. I mean, my students are very, very diverse. You know, about half of them end up working for McKinsey or, or Goldman Sachs and, uh, and maybe some work for Bernie Sanders. I don't, I don't know, but there is a great diversity of, 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 of viewpoints and I think I cannot generalize from that particular population, but, you know, but generally you, you're probably right that there is a kind of great uh, emerging concern among a younger generation about the world that they're inheriting. Uh, from us, and that some of that discussion is focused on on, on capitalism. Um, I, I did. I just two points of of, of, of uh, two comments. For one is, uh, I mean, the idea of re-regulating capitalism is very prominent in the political discourse right now, uh, and uh, different forms of regulation are probably uh, important. But I would always start from the from the argument that you know the capitalism is always regulated. You know, so it's not like that we are moving from an unregulated to suddenly regulated capitalism. But, but we just, there are thoughts about how capitalism can be regulated differently. A and B, you know, people have written and thought about capitalism for about 200 years. Uh, for about 200 years, people have predicted its end. And uh, obviously, this has uh, not happened, just the opposite. It has entered the moment of a new kind of dynamic, even quite recently. And if you look at you know, China, if you look at Shanghai, if you visit the city of Shanghai, you know, the thought of, you know, the end of capitalism would, I don't think, easily cross your mind. And, uh, and so I think what I learned from studying the long history of capitalism is, A, that it, it, its demise has been predicted many, many times over, but that obviously hasn't happened. And B, I think uh, capitalism is a very flexible uh, system, which I partly explained by saying earlier that it's kind of a connected diversity. It, it connects very diverse things in different regions of the world and different sets of people to one another in all kinds of different configurations. And in that way, uh, it, uh, you know, we, it, it's probably going to change. I mean, I would, that, that prediction I would venture, because that has always happened in history, it's probably going to change. Uh, 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 but uh, but uh, but in ways that you know is it is hard to predict right now and is uh, and, and I think the demise of it that that you know it, you know it, it you know every every social system has entered a moment of demise eventually you know so European feudalism in the 13th century nobody thought this would ever come to an end right and then it did come to an end so but. Nobody really knew when that was uh, was the case. So capitalism is historical; it's not a state of nature. Yes, but uh, but is the demise of it, you know, going to be forthcoming in the ne before the next elections? Uh, I, I very much doubt that. <laughs> I mean, I, I guess I would add to that too that ca capitalism is a is a is a very flexible system that also depends on a flexible oversupply of labor and and goods. And so that's something I think that our that this next generation, I think our students have been taking it very seriously. I think tethering the, the, the issues around capitalism to actually climate challenges and climate change, I think that's what makes our current moment a little bit different. And, and one of the things I know for some of my students that has been so appealing about AOC and Bernie Sanders in the Green New Deal is this notion that, hey, we've got to tackle what's happening to the earth, right? And we talked about that. We talked about land and we've talked about, and you and I over lunch talked about, I, I live in Arizona and Arizona is now, you know, trying to be really big in cotton, right? And very hot. <laughs> the, the, the nighttime temperature has risen by nine degrees in the last five years, right? And so, and cotton production requires a lot of water. So, you know, what, what's gonna happen as, as Arizona tries to produce more and more cotton? What's happening to that land? As the climate is is changing, and so I think this is a this we may be entering a moment where a social structure, the critique of it is dovetailing with 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 our, our questions around climate. So, so my question is perhaps for both of you, both of you, um, and that is how does cotton interact in the fourth industrial revolution, especially as you look at sort of end to end transparency and where it's grown and all the way to when it ends up in the landfill. And, and how does climate change interact with that? So cotton has been important all along. So the fourth industrial revolution is going to amplify its importance because of the disposable economy that, you, that you've discussed. 
but how does cotton interact in that fourth industrial revolution and how does climate change, because it's going to move the growing areas, uh, how will it interact because Arizona will not be able to grow cotton? Perhaps hemp, maybe. <laughs> they already do that. <laughs> right, that's a, that's a great question. I don't know if I have a very good answer to that. I mean, I would say if you want to understand the global economy today and you want to pick a commodity, you would probably not want to start with cotton because while cotton is still a pretty significant industry and many millions of people are engaged in that industry and it has very significant environmental implications, but I would not want to argue that cotton today is at the center of the global economy. So, so in that way, I don't think that would be the right track to take. Um, and. Uh, uh, and yes, as, uh, as, as you mentioned and was mentioned before, the environmental impact of growing cotton is, is quite significantly. It's the most chemical intensive crop that there is, despite its image of being a kind of natural fiber. It is extremely water intensive and we increasingly don't have enough of that. Uh, it is also fairly land intensive. So, uh, so I, I would agree with you that there are you know, we are running against kind of environmental constraints. We might not, you know, we might not actually be able to double the production of cotton in the next 30 years, even if the market for that kind of cotton uh, would exist. I, I think there are people who are working on trying to kind of recycle cotton clothing. Uh, there are certainly, you know, now when you go shopping at H&M, you can bring your old clothing and allegedly they're doing something good with it. Um, I mean, again, you know, it's 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 a it's a, what the world we live in right now is a completely wasteful use of all of these resources. I mean, it's it's completely insane, yeah. But uh, uh, but I don't think it's completely unimaginable that there would be a you know at least some solution to this problem. And then, as you mentioned earlier, of course, we increasingly consume uh, oil-based uh, fibers, and and for that, you know, that, that again has other kinds of environmental. Uh, in, 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 in implications. Hi, thank you very much. Um, okay. Um, thinking about your book or something like the 1619 Project, I was just wondering if you could talk a bit about the power of historical or archi archival sources or global history in uncovering forgotten people or shedding light on, you know, those who didn't make the history books, lost voices. Right, that's a, that's a really great question, and it actually connects to the discussion that was happening on this stage just an hour ago. And obviously one of the arguments of the book, or one of the findings of the book, is how crucial American slavery was to the expansion of cotton production worldwide, and how crucial that cotton production then was to, industrial, to the Industrial Revolution, and thus to industrialization, and thus to the rise uh, of the modern word and, um, and also how crucial enslavement was to the development of the American economy until the, let's say, at least the 1850s, but perhaps to the 18, 1860s. And, uh, and that has, a, you know, that discussion, as you seem to know, has an interesting politics to it. Because on the one hand, you know, I think post the 1960s, we most Americans came to accept that, uh, that slavery was a terrible institution and that it, uh, that, you know, that it was a very fortunate thing that in the American Civil War it was put uh, to, an, to an end. And in that way, most Americans were, for the first time, willing to confront the history of slavery. But in some ways, they made it quite easy to themselves because they argued that while it was terrible, it was kind of marginal to the nation's history. And especially if you lived in a place like where I live in Cambridge, Massachusetts, you know, it was like far away. It was more or less, you know, in the American South, even though there was, of course, also enslavement in New England. But it seemed like to be far away, and, you know, what did we have to do with that? And in the end, you know, we did fight the Civil War. A lot of people in Massachusetts died to fight against the institution of slavery. We are really the liberators. The story of America is a story of emancipation, of liberation. And again, that's a beautiful story, and it's also, you know, there is some truth to that. I mean, it is true, and we need to acknowledge that a lot of people died, you know, fighting against the institution uh, 
uh, of slavery, and there has always been a, a, an anti-slavery politics in the United States. There have always been people who have risked everything in their lives, like Charles Sumner, you know, being beaten up on the floor of the Senate. They, they risk everything to fight against the institution of slavery. But I think this work that, 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 that that's in this book, but also some other work that I've done, now shows that you know this wasn't so marginal to the nation's story. It actually had a huge impact on the larger development of uh, American politics, of American ideas, but also on the development of the American uh, economy. So for example, I've been engaged in a project with my own students to research how my own university, Harvard University, how deeply implicated Harvard was in the slave economy. And that came to it as a total surprise to all of us in, uh, in Cambridge, Massachusetts. And that many people don't take too kindly to that particular uh, finding, <laughs> um, which is, um, which is, I think it's, 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 I mean, I can explain it, but, uh, but I think it's too bad because, uh, because I think that is our history. And we are, you know, none of us is personally involved in that history. None of us was enslaved or enslaved somebody else. So there's no personal responsibility involved. But, uh, but we all inherit this history as being part of this nation even if we just, like myself, you know, just came like 30 years ago. But, you know, you can't just pick the nice parts of the history and then ignore the not so nice parts. I mean, you, you're part of this community and this community has a certain kind of relationship to the history uh, of enslavement and dispossession that we discussed, uh, discussed earlier. And, uh, and that history, of course, also has a material impact on the present world. Right? So the fact that some Americans didn't get paid for their labor for 300 years obviously has an impact on patterns of inequality today. Okay? So, or the fact that there was a huge wave of racial discrimination for 100 years or to this day after slavery has an impact on patterns of social inequality, uh, the, the, the social geography of cities and other such things. So, so I think we need to confront this history, accept that this is part of our national history. Uh, I think without doing that, it's, it's gonna be very hard to address the other issues that we're facing in, in American society uh, today. And I heard yesterday a fascinating talk about, the, about indigenous people in Canada. So, so it seems like societies can move in that direction. And I think we are actually moving in that direction. Yeah, there is much more of a discussion of these issues today than there was 10 years ago. Um, we are, we're really out of time, but it's Sunday, and okay, we'll go five minutes over. Uh, Bill has a very burning question, and I'm sorry, anybody else? Uh, Sven, are you going to be signing books? Yeah, would, yeah uh, he's going to be downstairs after this session, so if we didn't get to you, please go visit him downstairs. And Bill, I hope it's quick. Sure. Just uh, uh, given the Indian nature of this festival and all the Indians in the audience. Do you want to just talk a little bit about cotton in India and India's importance as a center of cotton production in pre-colonial times? Okay, I'm sorry, I should have done that right away. I guess when I spoke in Jaipur, I focused more on the Indian side of the story. <laughs> but, and I guess most Indians in the audience will not need you know, to hear again about that history, which is quite central to the teachings of history in India itself. But, but for those of you who are not versed in Indian history or uh, or, uh, or of Indian nationality. Um, India was the center of the global cotton industry for about 4,000 years. Nowhere in the world where was as much cotton grown, as many cotton textiles produced, as uh, on the South Asian continent. India was, since for the past 2,000 years, at the center of uh, global cotton trade networks. Uh, Indian cotton textiles found their way, for example, to the European continent already around in, during the Roman Empire, so about 2,000 years ago. Um, uh, cotton textiles from India were uh, one of the most important trade goods that Europeans, and uh, once they expanded into, into South Asia, that, that, that they ex exchanged uh, uh, with, uh, with, uh, with Indians. Uh, cotton, Indian cotton textiles were extremely important to the slave trade on the West African uh, coast and the quality of Indian cotton. So it was not just the quantity, not that they just produced a lot of cotton textiles, but if you have ever been to India and have ever, you know, looked at cotton textiles in India today, you get a, you can, you can understand that, that the quality of Indian cotton textiles was, 
was of was amazing. It was uh, you know uh, I mean it was so good that European manufacturers could not copy the quality of Indian textiles until approximately 1900, uh, and uh, and a lot of the techniques of European cotton manufacturing actually come from India. So the European cotton textile manufacturers in the 1750s or sent out people to travel to India to watch Indian artisans to see how they spin and weave and how they color textiles. And they wrote long books about it, which you now can find in libraries all over Europe. And basically, they applied that lesson then to the European textile, uh, textile production. So, so the whole story of cotton is really, you know, it's very much a story about India. And then, of course, in, cotton is very important to Indian history as well, for one, because it was a very important industry but also symbolically it becomes an important uh, point of contention with the British because many uh, Indians see that the economic policies of the British Empire towards India lead to a significant destruction of textile production in South Asia. And, uh, and then uh, the cotton becomes almost kind of the symbol of the Indian struggle uh, for independence, like Gandhi, like sitting at home spinning. Uh, it's uh, it's uh, it's it is really quite crucial to the to, to to Indian national history. And India is very crucial to the empire of cotton. I think I should have made that point earlier. I'm sorry, but here it is. <laughs> well, there you have it. Okay, I thank you very much, Sven Becker. Thank you.